All right. Good morning. There you are. You're out there. Good. Good to see you. Good to hear you. Uh, we welcome you to Cascadia Church. Those of us who are here present physically this morning, we've had a chance to pray, to get our notes out, to get our Bibles out. We're turned to the book of Hosea. So we're on our Route 66, Exit 28 today is the book of Hosea. So we are going to get into that. We're ready to go here. Now, for those of you who have done any kind of Bible teaching at all, at any level, whether it's uh, maybe leading a small group, teaching a small group, or a Sunday school class, Bible study fellowship, teaching or preaching, maybe even at home, raising your children, reading the Bible with your kids, and helping them to understand what the Bible says. You, you have probably, as I have in my life, in my ministry, in my experience, discovered that sometimes God wants you to live the message before you give the message. That if you're teaching an especially challenging part of the Bible, God will let you learn from him personally before you teach people publicly. That has often been uh, my experience, and I know that some of you as well. If, if that doesn't happen, then uh, sometimes God will give you the opportunity after you've taught the lesson to put it into practice, to practice what you preach, so to speak, right? Um, and even if you're not a Bible teacher or have that kind of a ministry, which is fine, there are several different kinds of ministries in which we can be involved. Uh, one of them is, is prayer. To be praying for one another, to be praying for other people, to be praying about your own needs and so forth. You perhaps have been cautioned uh, to be careful about how, how you pray for patience. Uh, because when you pray for patience, what happens? God gives you an opportunity to demonstrate patience. And so these kinds of experiences illustrate for us that God is actively involved in our lives. He knows what we're saying. He knows what we're praying. He knows what we're teaching. He knows what we're learning. And he wants us to learn well. He wants us to get it. He wants us to put into practice what he's saying. Now, we have seen recently in Route 66 that sometimes those that are the prophets from God, the Bible teachers of the day, were engaged in some very unusual behaviors to make their message get out and to have their message heard. Maybe not uh, apply, but at least the message was put out there and people saw and heard God's word in sometimes very unusual ways. For example, recently in the book of Ezekiel, there were many things that God wanted him to do. One of them that we saw was that he was, this prophet was to build a small model of the city of Jerusalem and to be bound in ropes and to lie down next to that model on his left side for 390 days. And then to flip over and lay on his right side for 40 days. And he was sending a message to the people of Jerusalem about the upcoming captivity. So that was, un that was an unusual thing. Hosea, though, see, we're, we're in the book of Hosea today. Hosea preached his message by being married to his message, by living his message. Uh, Hosea was told to do something very unusual, highly bizarre. God told him to marry an unfaithful woman named Gomer. Now that's a challenging assignment. I think it would be a challenging assignment to be married to a faithful woman named Gomer. Um, just, uh, but that was his assignment. Hosea was told after you get married, she's going to cheat on you. She's going to be unfaithful. We don't have any record that she was unfaithful or a cheater before they got married. We don't know that. Sometimes that's just speculation. But we know for sure after they got married, she cheated on him many times. And God said, listen, Hosea, every time she's unfaithful, forgive her. Bring her home. Bring her back. And Hosea's wife, Gomer, was so wild that she actually became a prostitute. She actually became a prostitute. And it got to the point where Hosea redeemed her. It'll come up in just a minute again, but 
Some say from the slave market. I think really, I think that's maybe a euphemism or a figure of speech. For he, he paid the full price and bought her from her pimp. Is what he did. And now he owns his wife fully. But before all that happened, they had three children. So Gomer was not only unfaithful to her husband, she was unfaithful to her children. They had Jezreel, Lo Ruhama, and Lo Ami. So the first child born to Hosea and Gomer was a boy named Jezreel. Nice Hebrew name, rather easy to pronounce. The association connected to the name, though, is a big challenge. Not for us to understand it, but it's difficult to comprehend it in our mind. Why would you name your child Jezreel of all things? Here's why. We don't get it unless we understand the, the history and the culture and the name Jezreel and what it means. Jezreel, there's a valley in Israel in the northern end called the Valley of Jezreel. In Jezreel, that location is associated with lots of bloodshed. Uh, today and in the future, we call that same valley the Valley of Armageddon. And so in this valley, it's a very strategic location. If you, re if you control the Valley of Jezreel, you control Israel, the land of Israel, you control all trade and commerce and communication between Europe and Africa and Asia and Africa. It's the most strategic piece of real estate on earth. More people have died in battle in the Valley of Jezreel than all of the world's battlefields combined. It's a very bloody piece of real estate. Now, to put it in modern, in a modern mindset, Hosea's assignment from God would be very much like this. Marry a German streetwalker, have a child, and name him Auschwitz or Dachau. That's the punch. Or marry a Japanese prostitute, have a child and name him Hiroshima. Name him Nagasaki. And people are going, are you out of your mind? What are you doing? That's the point. I'm not out of my mind, says Hosea. You are. Because you're being disobedient, you're being unfaithful to God. And Hosea has captured the attention of his people and the point is, there, listen, Israel, the northern tribes, there is a bloody, terrifying future if you do not repent. It's coming, and it will not stop unless you turn back to God and choose to remain faithful to him. So now, Hosea and Gomer had two more children, Lo Ruhamah, which means you will not have mercy. Wow. And another son, a daughter, Lo Rahama, and a son, Lo Ami, you are not my people. And so this is the message that God is sending to Israel through Hosea and Gomer's children. There's some powerfully strange stuff going on here. It's really bizarre. However, in the same book, in the book of Hosea, we find some verses that many of us uh, we're, we're quite familiar with some of these words, some of these verses. Take a look at this. Maybe you've heard this verse before. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Boy, isn't that the truth? Still, today, it comes out of the book of Hosea. Here's another one. They have sown the wind and they shall reap the whirlwind. Anybody hear that on the news this week? Oh, yeah. People are quoting scripture, but they're not necessarily being biblically prophetic. They're just angry and stirring up fear. Here's another one. 
When Israel was a youth, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. Now this, of course, is a prophecy. Uh, it's a twofold prophecy. The secondary fulfillment uh, happened in Matthew chapter 2, 14 and 15. Joseph took the child Jesus and his mother and left for Egypt. This happened so that when... Uh, so that what had been spoken by the Lord to the prophet will be fulfilled out of Egypt, I called my son. This comes out of the book of Hosea. Here's another one. Death, where are your thorns? Sheol, where is your sting? And maybe that reminds you of the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? When's the last time you quoted Hosea? Knowingly. Maybe you've said the wind and the whirlwind thing. Not knowing that it came from the Bible. It came from the prophet Hosea. So there's a, just a big, broad introduction to some of the content that's in this book of Scripture. Let's just do a simple uh, preview as we do every week. Ten words or less uh, in the book of Hosea. Uh, the prophet's marriage to the prostitute reflects God's relationship with Israel. Your, your notes there say God's message on the chart sheet it should say God's marriage or prophet's marriage prophet's marriage to prostitute reflects God's relationship with Israel God being faithful Hosea being faithful Gomer being unfaithful Israel being unfaithful here's another one the theme of Hosea is God's faithful love God is always faithful many key verses here's one that I chose I will heal their apostasy or they're, they're turning away from the truth their ignorance of the truth, their rejection of the truth. And I will love them freely because I've chosen to do so because my anger has turned away from them. What causes his anger to, to turn away from them? His compassion, his love for them. And you also have in your chart sheet, if you picked that up already this morning, this uh, image from Walk Through the Bible Ministries. We're doing the book of Hosea. She was unfaithful. She was a prostitute. That's why you see the red light. And that's why you see the hose. She was, uh, uh, in this image, she is wrapped in a hose to remind us of Hosea. So there are more puns I could say, but I'm not going to at this point. You know what I'm going to say. All right. Um, in the book of Hosea, the two main sections. The adulterous wife and her faithful husband. That's the first portion of the book. The second portion of Hosea from 4 to 14 is the adulterous Israel and faithful God. So if you get nothing else out of Hosea, you got it. That's what the book is about. Let's take a look. Let's take a deeper dive. Number one, uh, a marriage covenant is a lifelong faithful relationship. It's part of what this book illustrates for us. And the marriage between Hosea and Gomer uh, reflects God's relationship with Israel. As I said a moment ago, Hosea is like God who remained faithful to the one that they loved, even though both Gomer and Israel were unfaithful. So this is unconditional love demonstrated by both, by Hosea and by God. In the first segment here, Gomer is unfaithful to Hosea. Uh, she left him to commit sexual sin with other people. And uh, despite the depth to which and the distance to which her sin carried her, uh, Hosea chose to do, listen carefully, whatever it takes to bring her home. He did whatever it would take. And he did. Chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. The Lord said to me, this is Hosea speaking, Go again, love a woman who is loved by her husband, yet is committing adultery. As the Lord loves the sons of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love raisin cakes. So I purchased her for myself for 15 shekels of silver and an omer and a lethek of barley. Now, the woman who is loved by her husband, that is Gomer and Hosea. He's just using a different style of speech to make his point there. The idea of they've turned to other gods and they love raisin cakes. The idea here is that the raisins, raisin cakes were the offerings that they were giving to these false gods, specifically Baal or Baal. And he's saying here that you love, you love these things. Here's, here's the point, the application. You love what the false gods love. You love what the world loves. 
And that's why you don't love God. It's because you love the world and the things that are in the world. And so he purchased her for my, he said, I purchased her for myself. She already belongs to him. But he redeemed her and purchased her for himself. For 15 shackles of silver and a omer and a lethek of barley, uh, this amount of barley, 10 bushels plus, uh, is equivalent to 15 shekels of silver. The value is about 15 shekels. So apparently, Hosea didn't have enough cash to purchase her. So he redeemed her with cash and goods, the equivalent of 30 shekels total value, which is the price that Israel paid to redeem a slave. That's found in, in the law. So he paid that price and uh, redeemed his wife. The question is, from whom or from what did he redeem her? Did he purchase her? Uh, some say from the slave market. I think it was from uh, a lifestyle of prostitution. You know, men will pay to be with this woman, and he paid a larger price to keep her and to own her. Either way, uh, Hosea did whatever it would take to bring back to his home his wife. He didn't reject her, didn't divorce her, didn't throw her out. Uh, he brought back his wandering wife. And that is the picture that God wanted Israel to see. You, Israel, are wandering from me. You are committing spiritual adultery. You are unfaithful to me. But I want you back. And I will do whatever it takes to bring you back. You are my unfaithful, wandering wife. But I want you for myself. It's amazing. It's remarkable. And so God used Hosea to send a powerful message to unfaithful people. And they didn't listen. They went off into exile. Second point, number two, is this. The faith covenant is an eternal faithful relationship. An eternal faithful relationship. A faith covenant, what I mean by that is the way that God establishes or maintains or keeps a relationship with his people. How do God and people connect? Through a covenant, through an agreement, through an arrangement that's been made. In Hosea's day, the way that people began a relationship with God and kept a relationship with God was by being faithful to the law of God. God says, here's how I want you to live. Live this way and we're going to get along very well. But if you disobey, we're going to have a problem in our relationship. Now, in the law, God made provision for those who wander. Here's how to come back. Here's how to make it right. Do this. And we'll get along famously. And they said, we don't want to do that. We want to do our own thing. And God kept pleading with them and saying, we want you to come back. If not, there are going to be consequences. consequences. And they said, we'll take our chances. And they gambled and they lost. Then they were dispersed and they have not been recovered since. And so Israel wandered from God and refused to be restored. Chapter 8, verse 1 says, They have violated my covenant and rebelled against my law. There's the problem right there. There's the problem. In the same way that Gomer violated the marriage covenant, she was unfaithful and she refused to be restored. We look at chapter 11, verse 12. Ephraim surrounds me with lies and the house of Israel with deceit. Judah is still unruly against God, even against the Holy One who is what? Faithful. Now, all throughout the book of Hosea, we see this word Ephraim or this name Ephraim. It is a figure of speech. It's another word to refer to, as we can see also in this first phrase, Israel, the northern tribes. So Hosea is saying here, God is saying through Hosea that not only the northern tribes are unfaithful, so is Judah, so are the southern tribes. And we know that both went away into exile. Both were taken out of the land, which was the promise for them to keep as long as they were faithful to God. They were disobedient, they were taken out of the land. Uh, they repented and God brought the southern tribes back. And as I said earlier, the ten northern tribes are still scattered, have not returned. So the point is this. Um, God never gave up on his people. 
He kept on keeping on. He kept on encouraging them. He kept on wanting them back. Uh, God never has given up on his people. He doesn't give up on his people. That's you and me. And he never will. Why? Because God is faithful. God is faithful. Even if we're unfaithful, God is faithful. That's the theme of this book, God's faithful love. And so in chapter 14, verse 4, we read this. I will heal their apostasy. I read this earlier. I will love them freely because my anger has turned away from them. And the point is this. And it's the application for you and for me as well. Uh, no matter how far we have wandered, no matter how far, uh, God's ready to receive us back. And it may seem, it may feel like, you may think that you and God are separated by a thousand miles. It might even be more. But to return to God takes one step. He's really only one step away. And that step is to say this. God, I've wandered. I'm coming home. And that's what we do. We say to God, I failed. I was wrong. Our broken relationship is my fault. Tell him that. Speak these kinds of words. And the Bible says God will forgive. God will restore. God will heal. God will reconcile. So these are the kind of words we bring with us when we want to be restored to God, which takes us to our takeaway for this morning. I will remain faithful. See this verse, Isaiah, Hosea 14, 2? Take words with you and return to the Lord. What words? God, I've wandered. I'm coming home. Something to that effect. God has made every provision available for us to be right with him, for things to be made right. And it's never too late to make the right choice to come home, to become faithful, maybe for the first time in your life, to God, to be faithful to God. Or just to renew a relationship and say, God, I want to remain faithful. I don't want to wander. Keep me close. And so today, like every day, is the day to begin living faithfully. It's a day-by-day -day decision, a day-by-day -day commitment to be and to remain faithful. So these are the kind of words we bring with us to God as we return to him. Let's pray. Father, the message of Hosea is uh, strange, but deeply profound and meaningful and very practical for us. It illustrates just how much you love your people. It illustrates just how much you love us. That is, the New Testament says nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing. And Jesus said nothing can take us from your hand. Nothing. And it just, it illustrates also for us, God, just how far you will go to make uh, redemption available for us, to make reconciliation available for us. And you've made available uh, redemption through your son, Jesus Christ. You, I mean, Hosea paid a price that he could afford, and you paid a price that only you could afford. And that's your son. You've given us your spirit. You've given us your word that as long as we are abiding in your word, listening to what you have to say to us, to us uh, following the leading and the prompting of the Spirit of God, uh, we will not wander. We will not stray. And uh, that's just how much you love us and what you have done and just how willing you are to keep us close to you. Help us not to take any of this for granted, God. We want to celebrate your love and your goodness for us in a few moments here as we sing. But we want to, first of all, just say thank you, God, for the way that you love us. Help us to love you more. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, let's say goodbye. We're going to sign off. We're going to turn the fans back on. They get cooled down a little bit, and we'll do some singing, okay? Goodbye.